In chapter nine, we turn to looking at the social world. And uh, I think you cannot underestimate the power of social forces in shaping us. So again, we think about motivation as being critical, but a lot of motivation comes from social forces. We are fundamentally social beings. We are completely dependent on other people for every aspect of our lives. We want to be individuals. We want to convince ourselves that we don't have these dependencies um, and you know some people more than others uh, really rebel against this kind of social reality but if you really think carefully about where do all these ideas come from where does all our technology come from where does everything come from it comes from other people and uh, the reason we can be so ignorant about everything this is the point that Sloman and Fernbach make is because everybody else out there in the world is kind of propping us up and filling in all those gaps. We seem to have a lot of basic kind of built in uh, motivation to sort of figure out our place in the world. And that's in where these kind of social comparisons and contrasts come from. Uh, again, those are a fundamental part of the brain. Everything is kind of relative and contrast based, but we really want to know, you know, like, where do I stand relative to you? And what about that other person who I'm kind of jealous of? And, you know, all that stuff is constantly taking place and constantly shaping our perceptions of ourselves, our perceptions of others, and our kind of understanding of our place within the world. People routinely underestimate the strength of these forces. Um, and then furthermore, we can understand a lot about our own personalities in relation to how we interface with those social forces. How have we adapted our own behavior to deal with these social realities. We look a lot at, in this chapter, again, at these issues of self-control. How do we internalize these ideals that we get from society about how we should behave? And then how do we rebel against those when we misbehave? Uh, all these other kinds of forces um, will understand a lot about compression in terms of stereotypes and social uh, dynamics of uh, compressing information, trying to simplify, trying to put people into boxes. It turns out if we can understand the structure of these stereotypes in terms of two core dimensions, this is uh, Susan Fisk's work, uh, competence, which is also related to social dominance and extroversion, as we'll see in a moment, uh, and warmth, which is also related to agreeableness. Um, and so these two dimensions categorize a lot of the kind of space of uh, different uh, s stereotypes, how we perceive different groups. Um, and there's these very important uh, tests that have shown, indeed, that we do all have implicit uh, biases encoded in our brains, um, regardless of how you know non-racist we think we might be. At a rational level, our brains have soaked up these kinds of uh, pervasive social uh, messages and, and these kinds of uh, stereotypes. In terms of these dimensions of personality, uh, there's the big five uh, is the dominant way of categorizing and organizing this space of how we relate as individuals to this overall social world. Uh, two of these, again, agreeableness and extroversion are closely related to um, those kind of dimensions of stereotypes, uh, relative kind of social uh, outgoingness and social dominance uh, relative to um, uh, being more shy and less uh, outgoing. Uh, and agreeableness is really about how warm and embracing of other people in your social group you are, uh, as opposed to being more selfish and self-centered and, and more into your own status. Uh, openness is about kind of, uh, a kind of an engagement with other people's ideas uh, and willing to entertain other perspectives or, you know, favoring your own perspective and not wanting to be kind of uh, disturbed by other people's uh, ways of thinking about things. Conscientiousness is really about self-control. How much do you have that top-down frontal control? It's very closely related also to performance in academia. This trade-off again though also between creativity and conscientiousness uh, you see in, in that skate, in that scope. Um, neuroticism is associated with kind of overall emotional volatility, prone proneness to anxiety, uh, all these different kinds of 
to mention some people are just more calm and other people are more emotional than others. Fundamentally, the most important thing in, so, in the social world is this group dynamics. We are members of groups and towards those people who are in our groups, we feel strong, positive, affiliative, agreeableness, love kind of feelings. Unfortunately, for certain outgroups, um, and it's not doesn't happen with every case, but there's a tendency and a bias, and it's strong in some cases, to feel the opposite hate towards the outgroup. And all of the kind of evil aspects of culture and humanity and war and all the horrible things that have ever happened in our species and are continuing to happen in our species um, really play into this fundamental organizing principle of in group, who do we affiliate, who's on our team, who's in our tribe, who, who, who's with us and who's against us, who's the enemy, who's out there that, we, that we're fighting against. And it's just fundamental, it's how our brains are organized, okay? And you can see that politicians tap into this um, and manipulate these, these hot buttons uh, of, of these different group dynamics um, and it produces very, very negative effects. And so understanding fundamentally how these forces work and the power of these forces in shaping our behavior is essential for, uh, I think, the continued survival of our species. So uh, this happens in lots and lots of other species. Any, uh, any animal species that has essentially a social uh, organization, social structure has these in-groups and out-groups. It's just fundamental. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, and there's kind of, you know, battles and war and, and fights to the death um, in all of these cases. And so it's, you know, it's not just us. Speaking of which, we will look at finally origins, how everything started back, uh, way back in the day when we were fishes climbing out of the sea. Is that possible? What is, what's going on here? This is crazy. How did, how is it possible that, you know, something like us was, you know, sort of in, in some biological continuity with a fish, you know, I don't look anything like a fish. Thank you very much. Um, it's a crazy theory, uh, but if you break it down and you understand uh, in terms of what our bodies are actually made of, okay, it's very much like this Lego kit. Hey, look, I can take the same parts and rearrange them in different ways and make a whole bunch of different organisms, right? A whole different, a bunch of body shapes. And that's the critical thing to understand is that when you put us all under a microscope, we don't look very different from any other animal. Um, our building blocks, our little, our little Lego building blocks are absolutely the same. And it goes all the way down to the genes. Um, which define the kind of program that builds these Lego, box, Lego blocks into our overall body shape. And when you finally understand at that level how the whole system is put together, it's kind of like, yeah, of course, okay, it's not a big deal to make a fish out of me. <laughs> you just change the program and you take those Lego parts and it turns into something else. It's really, yeah, it has to happen that way. Um, so this is kind of, you know, a really powerful, uh, obviously important thing to understand is how, how does that work? How is it that our brains are shaped through this process of evolution? Um, and uh, what can we learn about uh, how different aspects of us uh, are shaped by that genetic code? How does the genetic basis of each individual person, the unique genetic uh, makeup of each individual person shape all these important features about us. So in particular, we're interested in psychology, not so much in the physical properties like height and weight, but much more about uh, these kind of cognitive functions. Uh, and there's this notion of G, this generalized intelligence, something that's common across all the different measures of intelligence. Um, and it seems to be about this kind of 0.5 level of heritability. So 50% of our genetic uh, of our overall intelligence level seems to come from our genes. On the other hand, if you look at this with other ways of analyzing it, it may be that there's important confounds from the twins, and in fact our heritability much, may be about half of that on average. Um, and so uh, there's lots of things to understand about these different methods, how they come up with these different estimates of heritability. There's very, very important biases in this, and so we don't really know the absolute level of heritability. 
um, it's probably not 0.5. It's probably much lower, um, and it that means that the environment depends a lot more, um, which makes more sense in terms of how important learning is for organizing brains. And then we'll look at development and see, you know, this amazing process of how uh, babies turn into adults and, and how our brains are shaped by all of these experiences that we have. Um, and, and it's really amazing when you see how much babies learn all on their own, really were there, where parents were sort of hovering over them, trying to get them to learn this stuff, but <laughs> they're doing most of the driving by themselves. And, you know, they're soaking up stuff from us, but uh, it's amazing how powerful our learning abilities are and these developmental milestones that kids go through will understand uh, how, those, how those unfold over time. And finally, we'll end with uh, a discussion of disorders, how the system breaks down. Um, disorders, mental disorders are very prevalent. Uh, cumulative uh, risk of getting one or more kind of uh, mental disorders is near 50% in the United States. Uh, so one out of two people will experience some kind of mis mental disorder in their lifetime. Um, and uh, it's, you know, just all kinds of uh, different ways in which the system breaks down. On the other hand, there are a lot of commonalities. And, and these commonalities tell us, again, very much about how the brain works. The importance of control is essential for understanding how, how the brain um, exerts this agentic force and is constantly trying to control the world. And when we lose control, we lose that sense of self-efficacy. Um, that's a key element of all these mental disorders. There's a way of understanding this. Uh, there's a term called comorbidity, which is this uh, commonality that, that you have across different mental disorders. So let's say you have first a kind of anxiety disorder, but then as that develops, it turns into a also kind of comorbid depression. So you're also feeling depressed. And a lot of this is because you're feeling this loss of control over your feelings. You can't control your anxiety. Um, and that makes you depressed because you now experience a fundamental lack of control over your world and your mental state. Um, and so that loss of self-efficacy leads to the, the phenomena of depression. Also, a very critical element of all these disorders is social isolation. Uh, there's a, actually a very reasonable interpretation of schizophrenia in terms of not a split in the mind itself, but really a split between uh, the person and their social world, and that it really becomes essentially a, a breakdown in, in that connect, connection, that fundamental connection we have with the outside world um, is, is what really leads to schizophrenia. This diagram shows us how there can be this essential kind of uh, attractor state. This is a chaos theory kind of concept that you may start off with a lot of different kind of source etiologies, origins of, of some kind of disorder. And these can be, you know, events that take place in the world, different states of your brain. Um, lots of different things can contribute to these etiologies, these starting points. But because of these kind of things, and, we and they talk about this in this field in terms of network effects, networks of symptoms, that you end up kind of end up in this trajectory where very typically you'll end up with depression and anxiety also um, as comorbid along with whatever kind of starting point you started out with. And you can see here that, in fact, anxiety and depression really are the, the most prevalent uh, forms of mental disorder. Um, roughly 7% of people at any given time will be experiencing a kind of clinically recognized high level of anxiety that, that kind of classifies as a desire, of course, a disorder. Of course, everybody has uh, some level of anxiety you know, on a daily basis, and we'll talk about what it means to have a disorder level of anxiety. Uh, about 5% have depression, drug use, alcohol abuse. You can see it kind of goes down the line here. Um, and so, uh, but these anxiety and depression effects, we think, according to this kind of attractor model, this network model, um, really are kind of something that emerge out of this lack of control. Um, and they may not be this kind of simple uh, imbalance in the brain, this chemical imbalance. And all of these things help us understand why therapy is so effective. And it turns out that therapy is as effective 
uh, are more effective than drugs for the vast majority of cases of depression and anxiety. And it's because it builds this, it rebuilds these sense of self-efficacy and control and those safe social bonds in the context of this therapeutic relationship, it kind of re-centers, re-establishes, re-boots uh, uh, the, the person's sense of self. Um, and, and that is the essential function of therapy. And there's lots of important details about how therapy works. Uh, but the core element that, that's been identified is this fundamental kind of therapeutic alliance between the person who's suffering and the therapist who's there to help them. And there have been a number of studies that show, again, that this form of therapy called uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is, is better or uh, at least equal to uh, the prevalent use of these Prozac uh, kind of drugs, these SSRIs, um, and there's much fewer side effects associated with therapy than drugs. Okay, so overall, it's a, it's a much preferred treatment. On the other hand, it's expensive, um, and it takes that human being there to help you. Um, and so uh, there's a major challenge in delivering this very effective form of treatment for all the people out there who are suffering. In summary, uh, we can see across all of the different chapters that we're going to look at how compression, contrast, and control manifest across all of these different domains coming out of the neuroscience, applying to understand perception, uh, learning, uh, thinking, and especially in the social domain, these social comparison effects and the importance of control in the social domain. We will uh, dig into all the details of this going forward. Hope you uh, enjoy that and we'll uh, pick it up next time.